I don't know how well this is going to go down. This is going to be a very long video and I have some very unpopular opinions about Halloween ends, but I'm really looking forward to doing this. It's going to be a very long video, so get a drink, get some food. Let's talk about this thing. Good evening. My name's Evan, and welcome to Rockland Graves. It's been about a year since the conclusion of David Gordon Green's controversial Halloween trilogy, so I figured that it would be a good time to take a look at that final entry in the timeline now that it's had time to settle in. If you've seen the videos that I did on Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills, then it's no secret to you that I was a huge fan of those first two movies, despite Kills taking a lot longer to click. As a longtime fan of the franchise, I was elated to finally be getting films that I felt understood the character of Michael Myers, even if he wasn't always utilized in the best ways. They had heart, effective atmosphere, simplified the lore, and boasted the best music in the franchise since its birth in 1978. The franchise as a whole had suffered more than a few blows over its many iterations until Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 left the future of the series very hazy. In Halloween 2018, fans were treated to the first sequel in almost 10 years, and this film was generally well received by fans and very well received critically, becoming the most well reviewed entry since the original. It was written to work as a standalone experience, but also with the potential for sequels in mind were it to be successful enough, and it sure was. Halloween 2018 grossed over $250 million on a $10 million budget dethroning Scream as the highest grossing slasher movie of all time. While its success basically guaranteed a sequel, in 2019, Blumhouse instead announced two sequels slated to release in 2020 and 2021. Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends were both pushed back by a year, releasing in 2021 and 2022 respectively. Halloween 2018 was generally seen as a successful return to form for the franchise that pleased most fans, but Kills saw a far less favorable release. It was widely panned by critics and fans alike despite some promising test screenings. Many found it to be a messy shitfest of a movie filled with stupid characters and little suspense, instead opting for a balls-to-the-wall gore fest that seemed antithetical to the more methodical and creepy original. Kills is not without its flaws, and I talked about them lots in my video, but I have to be completely honest, it's one of my favorite sequels. There's a really great Halloween tone that fits right in for a yearly October viewing. It's fast paced and it's intense and the score is brilliantly haunting. There's very little stalking from Michael, but I love the idea of Laurie setting off the beast by leaving him to burn in a basement, only for him to emerge from the ashes with a viciousness everyone knew was there, but he'd never fully let loose. It's an amusement ride for hardcore Halloween fans that works really well for me, but it's been a very divisive entry that has settled somewhere in the middle for most people. After the discourse surrounding Halloween Kills, the one thing that everyone could agree on was that there would not be another Halloween movie as divisive as that for a long time. Kills felt like it was spinning in the mud, waiting for ends, so now that we're getting one that'll move things forward more and close the story off, surely it'll be better received. Yeah, not only was Halloween ends absolutely tanking in the ratings, but it was also the lowest grossing film out of the trilogy. Working with the same $20 million budget Kills had, ends gross over $30 million less than its predecessor in the box office. It did review generally better by critics, but fans of the franchise were outraged at what they found to be a disrespectful finale to the 44-year saga of Laurie Strode and Michael Myers. Kills in 2018 had their fair share of weird moments, but ends with such an unorthodox way to conclude a legendary storyline and people were not happy with the send-off that this movie gave. It had all the right ingredients for a perfect Halloween movie, and instead of playing it safe and making a crowd-pleasing epic finale for Michael and Laurie, ends went in a completely different direction. Part of the reason I've waited so long to make this review is because ends took a lot more time to settle in than the others thanks to those wild swings it takes, and I wanted to give it time to cool off in my head and really figure out where I stand on it, and now that my thoughts on it are pretty solidified, it's finally time to dive into the third and final chapter of David Gordon Green's Halloween trilogy and see if it stuck the landing. It's Halloween. We're gonna have a good time tonight. 
Halloween Kills picked up on the same night that 2018 left off, continuing that one bloody night that left Haddonfield severely wounded and Michael seemingly victorious. Karen's trap for Michael put him just where she wanted, and while the mob seemed to be doing well at first, Michael ended the night by showing everyone in Haddonfield that he truly is the boogeyman they'd whispered about for 40 years. Karen was killed by Michael in the same spot Judith was killed in 1978, and in the extended cut we saw Lori leave the hospital with a knife to go find the thing that took so much from her. Around the time the extended cut for Kills came out, David Gordon Green said in an interview that while the extended cut ending is still canon, he felt that showing Laurie walk out the way she did wouldn't fit where the next movie was picking up, and so it was cut. That's a confusing sentiment, but what it basically boils down to is just what you decide to show the audience. It can be true that Laurie walked out of the hospital like this, but it might also be the case that showing her wouldn't be necessary because the opening of Ends is such a far cry from where we left off. There's a four year time jump from the end of Kills to the beginning of Ends, and because we don't get much of what happened in that gap filled in by the movie, showing Lori on a murder path and then cutting right to where she's at there would be jarring. It's indicative of the trilogy not being thoroughly planned out, but because that ending was cut from the theatrical version of Kills, I won't be too hard on the messy feeling that can leave you with. Halloween Ends is a very different Halloween movie, and it lets you know that right away. While the last two had a very ominous score over the logos, this entry kicks off with an upbeat radio broadcast of a rock and roll station playing Midnight Monster Hop by Jack and Jim. That's a very different tone to start the movie off with, and it's one of a few things that Ends does to brace you for this being a departure from what you've come to expect. Another one of those things that should be a dead giveaway for anyone who's a fan of the franchise is the familiar font from Halloween 3, which was a Halloween sequel that did something completely different from the previous two movies and didn't prominently feature Michael Myers. That movie was absolutely panned when it first came out, but people are starting to come around now that they know what to expect going in. I appreciate that Ends starts off letting you know to prepare for something wildly different. This movie starts off on Halloween night 2019, a year after Michael's rampage through Haddonfield after his 40 year incarceration. Something that I've complimented a few times with this trilogy is how much care they put into making the streets of Haddonfield feel like Halloween night and that continues on with this entry. The kids are all out trick-or-treating in their costumes and the lawns are decorated for the season. This kind of set design goes a long way to building up a good Halloween atmosphere and I just, I really appreciate that these movies put in the time to build that feeling up. The trilogy as a whole has been shot well, but Ends is by far the best looking out of the three. I mentioned the set design, but just look at the lighting in these exterior shots of the house. I think out of all three, this one does the best job at creating the feeling of Halloween night right off the bat. This is where we meet up with 21 year old Corey Cunningham, who we'll become very familiar with. Huh. I feel like a have I seen this guy somewhere before? He's played by Rohan Campbell, and this character is one of the biggest points of contention with the movie, so we'll be talking lots about him. Corey's here at the Allen household to babysit their 10-year-old son Jeremy while his parents go to a costume party. There's a nice dynamic between Corey and the parents. You know, Roger picks at Corey within moments of him coming in the house, and Teresa asks him about his plans for college, which is nice, but holy shit, this woman ignores everything Corey says. Where'd you think of going? Oh, I'm applying to a few different engineering programs. Just saving money this year so I could go Jeremy, next Jeremy, the sinner's here! Something that I've really enjoyed about all three of these movies is the character dynamics and the little details and conversation that I find adds a lot to the cohesiveness of the town. One example I pointed out in my Kills review was that little detail where Ray and Lonnie told the same story about when they were in high school, but with one detail swapped. And for me, that made their relationship immediately feel more tangible, despite them never sharing a second of screen time together. The banter between Roger, Corey, and Teresa asking him about saving money does something similar. A lot of it comes from the good on-screen chemistry between characters, but it makes the history between those characters feel fleshed out in a natural way. I know these are small details, but the reason I point them out is because I've always found there's a really sweet level to certain conversations in this trilogy, and these little touches are a big part of that. Teresa fills Corey in, on Jeremy's fear of the dark since Michael's attack last year, and she lays out some ground rules before her and Roger leave for the party. Since last Halloween, all the events and, you know, the headlines of Michael Myers. As soon as his parents leave, Jeremy Allen drops the nice, playful child persona and his true colors show. I don't really feel like pretending to be best friends with an ugly ass boy babysitter. A psychotic, manipulative, evil, hate-filled little shit. Jeremy can't even be in a good mood when watching The Thing, but that put him in therapy. Michael Myers kills babysitters, not kids. 
I miss Julian. If I had some other kind of babysitter, she'd be reading me a story. I wouldn't be up clipping my nasty ass toenail. Having John Carpenter's The Thing play is a nice nod to both Carpenter himself, but also to The Thing from Another World that Tommy and Lindsay were watching in the original. Corey decides to treat himself to decadency with some chocolate milk and a piece of banana bread. Yeah, between Heineken and chocolate milk, I'd, I'd probably do the same. Before he's able to enjoy his snack, he hears commotion in the other room and finds Jeremy missing and the lamp knocked over. He searches around the house and even checks outside, but comes up with nothing. This sequence has such a dense, ominous feel that really puts you on edge. You know something is bound to go wrong, and you might think you know what it is, but this movie's about to pull the first of many curveballs. Corey hears a door slam and runs downstairs to find the knife he left on the counter missing. And while he doesn't notice this, there's a shadow scene in the other room, implying that the boogeyman is here to celebrate Halloween the only way he knows how. More noise is heard upstairs, and this time Jeremy yells out in fear. Here's another example of Ends being a gorgeous looking movie. The way this stairwell is lit to cast these hard shadows is just fantastic. He finds the missing knife laying near the top of the staircase and the door to the attic left open. He walks through the door, but it's slammed shut behind him and Jeremy can be heard mocking him on the other side. Hey, let me out. Are you scared? Okay. Thankfully, Roger and Teresa are pulling into the driveway, so that little shit is about to get what's coming. Corey begins panicking and kicking at the door, but dude, just wait a sec. His parents are about to come into the house and then Jeremy will get what he deserves. He'll get grounded. What was that? He had it coming. I should have known that would happen. They pretty much spelled it out a second ago. Crash landing! Oh. Roger and Teresa run over to the broken body of their son, and Corey stands frozen at the top of the stairs with a knife in his hand, resembling an iconic image of Michael Myers. The Halloween franchise has its fair share of impactful opening scenes, but I'd go as far as to say this is the best one since the original. That ominous buildup where you think Michael is going to show up after a year of silence only to completely flip the script and have the babysitter accidentally kill the kid is such a good way to catch fans off guard. Everything about this scene perfectly sets the stage for the rest of the movie and establishes a strong tone right off the bat. And that transition to the title card gives me goosebumps every single time. What? The way Jeremy's body falls and snaps on the ground looks so weighty and brutal. It's an insane sight. To cap it off, we have what I think is the best credit sequence of a trilogy that's been absolutely killing it in that department. I love how these credit sequences tie in thematically with each of these movies. Halloween 2018 had that rotten pumpkin being brought back to life, just as that movie was returning a messy franchise to its roots and reviving it after almost 10 years of being dead. Kills had 12 burning jack-o'-lanterns, which was both meant to reflect the number of Halloween movies up to that point and also the fiery, rage-fueled mob that Haddonfield turned into. This time around, we have the Halloween 3 font returning to set this one apart from the rest. The jack-o'-lanterns return once again to reflect the themes of Halloween ends by having each split away and show a different face, symbolizing the transference of evil and the idea that it will always continue in another shape. I also really appreciate that the second jack-o'-lantern is a recreation of the one from the original's opening credits. That to me implies like the first jack-o'-lantern is the evil in Michael, and it's always been around, but then the first time that we saw it was in that original movie. So that, that's a really cool setup. To top it all off, the final pumpkin we see is completely blank. It splits open and we go inside of it, conveying the theme of exploring the unknown and mysterious evil that we'll be getting a look inside of. John Carpenter returned to score this concluding chapter alongside Cody Carpenter and Daniel Davies once again. And just as with 2018 and Kills, the score is immaculate. It's really impressive to me that all of these scores are like distinctly different, but they are all top notch. I'd have a hard time definitively choosing a favorite one of the bunch, but the one here is a strong contender. 2018 was a great modernized version of the original soundtrack that reimagined a lot of its motifs and brought new tracks that have already been immortalized. Prison Montage and The Shape Hunts Allison were standouts and both give me chills to listen to. The score for Kills was more aggressive and dramatic, which is something that can be said when comparing those two movies as a whole. Logos Kill, Gather the Mob, Rampage, Hallway Madness, It Needs to Die, and Unkillable are all incredible, but 
I think Michael's Legend takes the cake. It's such an atmospheric and mysterious track that conveyed what Michael Myers is all about so perfectly. Ends has a far darker and foreboding tone with his score, again, something that can be said when comparing it to the previous two movies. There's a feeling of somber reflectiveness throughout a lot of it, and it's overall a dense and incredibly atmospheric soundtrack that's a beautiful conclusion to John Carpenter's involvement with the franchise. Laurie's theme Ends revisits the classic theme from the original and tweaks a few things that pull at my heartstrings. Cool Cool Kid and Transformation feel like the start of something dark. Tracks like Because of You, Requiem for Jeremy, Corey's Requiem, and Where Are You convey a strong feeling of contemplation. Well, the junkyard and the procession deserve their spots right next to the most iconic tracks in the franchise. Soft pads and deep bass stabs are employed a lot and mixed with piano to build a very lush and emotional soundscape that might be the best score since the original movie. Which I think is something that I have said about all three of David Gordon Green's Halloween movies, so John Carpenter is still unmatched. There are other noteworthy tracks as well, but it'll feel more fitting to bring them up when we get to their scenes. So. For now, let's move on to the three-year time jump after that opening scene. Like the original Halloween and its sequel, Halloween 2018 and Kills could be watched as one three-hour long Halloween movie as they took place on the same night. And spaces itself out quite a bit from that brutal night in 2018 and takes place in 2022, marking four years in Haddonfield since Michael left the town with open wounds. We get some idea of how that night affected Haddonfield through a voiceover from Laurie Strode. The suffering Michael caused became an infection passing on to people who never even crossed his path. Something that Ends seems to struggle with a fair bit is having a lot of ideas crammed into a runtime that feels somewhat stuffed. So certain things are rushed through to get them established, but a lot of it winds up clunky. We don't need a recap of this timeline, at least not in such a forced manner. Each entry in this trilogy was released in relatively close proximity. And if you're seeing a movie called Halloween Ends without catching yourself up, then it's all on you if you're confused. The final entry in a story doesn't need to be approachable for people who haven't seen the other movies, so the runtime is better spent on the story that's actually being told here. Especially with the wild swings this movie takes, they shouldn't have wasted any time on unfamiliar viewers so they could flesh out everything else as much as possible. Although this sequence isn't just a recap, it also fills in some of what's happened since that night in 2018. Haddonfield has been left broken by what Michael left behind, living in constant fear and paranoia, looking for someone to blame in Michael's absence. Oscar's mother hung herself while wearing her son's Halloween costume, which is a neat detail to tie things together a bit. We also learn through a news clipping on Lori's wall that the Myers home was demolished sometime after the events of Kills, which creates a lot of questions. In Kills, it seemed like Michael's primary motivation was simply to return home, with the massacre being a byproduct of him running into people along the way. The movie ended with him finally reclaiming his spot by the window in Judith's room after he killed Karen, which I still think is one of the best images of Michael Myers in this entire franchise. Having the home be destroyed off screen in between movies is a really weird choice considering how iconic it is and how pivotal it seemed to be in this storyline. I've got no problems with it happening, but I would have liked to see that take place and have it be a big moment instead of being glossed over with a news clipping. We're then caught up on how Laurie's been doing, and this is definitely one of the more controversial elements of this film. After the fabled night in 1978, Laurie became a hardened survivor who devoted her entire life to preparing for the escape she knew Michael Myers would make someday. She looked into his eyes that night and knew he was the boogeyman and her obsession with killing Michael took precedence over everything else, including her relationship with her daughter and the family she eventually had. Even after being injured, she had no hesitation in trying to go back out and find him after learning that her trap hadn't worked, and she was unable to do anything with the injuries she'd sustained. Michael ended the night by killing Lori's daughter, which would presumably breathe new life into the flame of hatred that had burned inside of Lori for four decades. Apparently, that's not what happened. In the four years since that night, Lori has tried to move on from Michael and the terror he left behind. Her and Allison moved in together in a new house, and she's even seen putting up Halloween decorations, something that she would have never done before. She stopped being a hunter, instead focusing on healing and enjoying a more peaceful life. This is... jarring, to say the least. The novelization goes into more detail about how she got where she is at the end of Kills to where we see her now, but I don't want to use that in this review because we're looking at the movie and that stuff simply isn't explained. I do have the novel sitting back there actually, I should have 
I should have put it in the display. I will touch on some things that the novelization added later on, but I won't use it to excuse the movie not explaining things. The only thing that a viewer can grab to explain why Lori switched up her life so quickly is the revelation she had in Kills when Frank told her that Michael was never after her. It was a doctor that took him to your house tonight. It wasn't Michael. It was that paranoia that made her the way she was in Halloween 2018 and Kills. She was preparing for him to come after her, but he never actually gave a shit. You could surmise from that that even for someone who initially wanted vengeance, the years of silence after, stacked with the knowledge that they were never in the danger they thought they were, could make them decide to let go in time. It's left up to the viewer to try and piece together why the hell Lori let go of what happened after Michael escaped things, which Seems like a very strange thing to not get into detail about since her entire character in the last two movies was purely devoted to taking him down. Once again, this is a good example of the trilogy not being planned out ahead of time. A lot of these awkward beats and ends are things that I don't necessarily have an issue with inherently, but it's often more that they don't feel detailed enough or feel like they should have happened somewhere else in the story. There's enough of this kind of thing that I almost feel like there should have been four movies in this new timeline if this is where they wanted things to end up. That would have given them a lot more time to make these huge character and story redirections feel more natural. All that being said, I actually really love the portrayal of Laurie Strode in this movie. That makes you want to rip off your shirt and show grief your fucking tits and say, you know what, let's go. This, to me, feels like the most natural progression of the character from the original film, although H2O does a really great job of this. Because I'm such a Halloween nerd, I don't have much issue filling in what could have happened between movies to have Laurie wind up where she is, and I felt the novelization was satisfactory in what it added, but both of those are subjective points and don't make the jarring feeling of the time jump any more forgivable. Because this was apparently the last Halloween movie with Jamie Lee Curtis, we'll see about that, I was just glad to see a portrayal of Laurie from Jamie that felt like the character we saw in the original again. She can be so charming and sweet, and it gave that insane nerd living in my heart a warm, fuzzy feeling. No! I wanted to bake you a pumpkin pie as a Halloween if you want an idea of where I'm coming from, despite all my critiques of that voiceover sequence, it's actually made me tear up a bit every time I've watched the movie. Huddenfield was a peaceful town. And then one Halloween night many years ago, all of that was lost. Just seeing that recap of this 44-year-old saga that's about to come to a close was really emotional for me. So. That'll let you know how insanely dorky I am about this franchise. For a more objective positive about this, at least they motivated the sequence by having it be an excerpt from a memoir that Laurie's writing. This would have been so much worse if it didn't have that context, but because so much of this movie feels like a reflective epilogue, a memoir seems like a fitting thing for Laurie to be working on. It's also where the updated and extended Laurie's theme plays, and good God is it ever an emotional piece of music. It's Her writing is interrupted by a smoke alarm that got set off by a pumpkin pie she was making for Allison that she forgot was in the oven. Oh, fuck! I mean, it's my pie! I put a pie in the oven! Lori's trying to celebrate Halloween, but it just seems like she can't quite get there. Do you have your costume for the party? I told you, I don't want to go alone. So I'm not going. That was a nice little scene for Lori and Allison, and thankfully, now we've got those silly characters that we spent two movies getting invested in out of the way. Now it's time to get to what everyone bought their ticket for, the dorky bespectacled man on a bicycle. Now, put yourself here. You're in the writer's room, working on wrapping up a 44-year saga of one of the most iconic and revolutionary horror films of all time. The original actor who played the adversary of the boogeyman. The creator of the original movie is involved, and you've got an actor who's breathed new life into the villain with the best performance since that original. This is the epic conclusion, and you've got all the ingredients you need to make it one of the best slasher sequels ever made. Do you, A, go back to the simplicity that made that first movie work so well, creating a swan song for this saga and its characters by returning to its roots with one final showdown between the heroine and the thing that traumatized her over four decades ago? Or... B. Say fuck that noise, let's do some weird shit and introduce a new main character out of nowhere and follow him for the majority of the movie. You might have picked option A, but David Gordon Green fully committed to option B, so you'd better get used to seeing Corey Cunningham. Corey Cunningham? 
I knew I recognized his attire somewhere, but that name's ringing a few bells of its own. I'm sure that's nothing. Anyway, Corey works at a junkyard as a mechanic. His stepfather Ronald runs the place, and he gets after Corey for always being late to work, but then he gifts him with an old motorcycle he doesn't use anymore. Meanwhile, Allison is on her way to work when she's pulled over by the embodiment of police officers in the minds of many. You're under arrest. For being the prettiest girl I know. Below the overpass, we see a homeless man filling up his cart, and I absolutely fucking love the foreboding feeling that's built up when we slowly zoom in on a sewer while one bar of the theme plays before we get an angle looking out from within the dark. There's something about that moment that has always felt so haunting. Corey takes his new bike to the shop, reuniting with his one true love. Thanks to that little shit, he never got to enjoy his back then, so I'm glad he's taking this moment to treat himself with that wonderful gift from God. In one of the most David Gordon Green scenes of the movie, a group of high school marching band kids bully Corey after trying to get him to buy them alcohol for the game tonight. Bring you a little milk. <laughs> yeah, I like milk too. I like milk too? Are you, are you fucking kidding me? All right, anyway, Corey says no, and one of the kids recognizes him as the one who supposedly killed Jeremy Allen, and this sets the whole group off. So where's your next victim? What the fuck? Oh, for fuck's sake, let the man have some goddamn chocolate milk. I know this sounds really goofy, but I please hear me out on this. The chocolate milk thing is actually thematically relevant. I'll be looping back to it once things are more established. Lori shows up in the nick of time and coaxes Corey into getting some sweet, sweet vengeance. So do you want to do it? Or you want me to? It's pretty clear that the residents of Haddonfield are none too fond of Lori and Corey, but with how much fun that is to say, they should really reconsider. These two have been through some really awful things, and the town has turned on them, but it's nice to see that they get each other. Lori figures she'll try playing matchmaker with Allison, and decides to bring Corey into the hospital for his hand, and as soon as Allison lays eyes on the dorky, bespectacled man with chocolate milk coursing through his bloodstream through a hole in his hand, she optically fucks him with no hesitation. Allison falls hook, line, and sinker for Corey right away, and I know that's something that really annoys a lot of people. There are issues with this movie that I felt baffled by that I've since reconciled with, but the speed that the relationship between Corey and Allison develops isn't something I ever had a problem with. It doesn't seem far-fetched at all for these two to recognize each other and know that they both went through very traumatizing events that made the town of Haddonfield treat them unfairly or at least very differently. It's trauma bonding, but I mean, you know, there are also countless examples of movies where a guy will like a cute waitress, for example, and they're, they're dating the next day. Sometimes people just click, and I can absolutely see these two connecting really quickly over the thing that happened to them on Halloween night one year apart. Anyway, Allison works for Dr. Mathis, and if that name sounds familiar, it's because that's the same man Marcus was telling Vanessa about at the start of Halloween Kills. Tomorrow morning, I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna quit that punch job. Dr. Mathis in the face. Dude's just as much of a dirtbag as they made him out to be. Cute, isn't she? I don't know. I hope he gets punched in the face. This chunk of the movie is all about building up the relationship between different characters, and I really enjoy it. Corey and Allison share a lot of sweet but awkward banter as they fumble over flirting with each other. Why can't the bicycle stand on its own? No, no, it can't. It's got a kickstand. Because it was too tired. <laughs> Lindsay surviving Halloween Kills made it seem like she'd probably have a more prominent role in Ends, but she's barely here. I do really like this scene with her, Allison, and Lori shooting shit, though. He was injured, he needed medical attention, and Dr. Matthews is the best do in town. Do not believe a word she says. <laughs> That's immediately juxtaposed by seeing a dinner at Corey's house. Ronald's a gem, but Corey's mother, Joan, is an absolute nightmare. Boys who keep secrets don't get custard for dessert. One of my favorite scenes of the movie is when Lori's out grocery shopping and she bumps into Frank, and it gives the two a chance to catch up a bit. It's a really, really sweet scene that shows how both of them have tried to move on from what happened. I like your face. I mean, I like seeing your face. So do you. I mean, I do too. I like seeing you too. That nice feeling is cut short, sadly, when Lori gets confronted outside of the store by... Wait, what the fuck? Sandra's alive? Right, so what I'm gathering uh, is that being stabbed in the throat is simply not lethal in this universe. Good to know. Yes! I feel like I won an extra life. Ooh. 
Despite his initial reluctance, Corey agrees to going to a costume party with Allison for a fun night out, and there's a great cameo with Nick Castle. They could have had him do a cameo as Ben Tramer, and the fact that they didn't do that is a missed opportunity, but after ends, I'm all on board with Lori and Frank anyway. The night seems to be going well as the blossoming couple drink together and dance the night away, but that nice moment between them is also cut short when it turns out that Teresa is also at the party, and she snaps when she sees Corey out enjoying himself. You don't understand it's difficult to come here and take off your little grass and have a good time with your friends. Angry, upset, and berated, Corey storms out of the party and Allison chases after him. You're a hero with your struggles, and ask anyone. I'm the psycho babysitter. I'm the fucking kid killer. Corey leaves Allison empty-handed as she reaches out her hands to offer the connection they've both been deprived of, but he storms off. The picture that's painted by that scene and the one at the grocery store is one of isolation and judgment. And this is where the chocolate milk comes in. All of these people went through something horrible and their hometown turned on them, blocking them off into a lonely world that won't let them move on with their lives. They're all constantly reminded that they're not welcome even in the most mundane places. And the things that we take for granted in our daily lives become a massive struggle because of it. They're denied simple pleasures, and it's really heartbreaking to see these people just trying to get by and move on, but being unable to because of the misdirected anger and vitriol from those around them. The chocolate milk is a very, you know, innocent, childlike thing that you just want to be able to enjoy but he can't, he's just not allowed to. These nice moments being cut short by people yelling at them for just going about their lives really pushes one of the movie's core themes of people always needing someone in front of them to direct blame at, even if the person isn't guilty of the thing they're being accused of. It fucking sucks. I find it really exciting that there's a Halloween movie where I can go into this much detail about with the themes, but I know most people aren't going to these movies for a character drama. I was invested in the characters after the last two movies because I'm an insane Halloween nerd. So I was all in on the heavy emphasis of character development and thematic exploration. The whole trilogy was trying to touch on more than just being straight up slasher movies, but Ends was the most successful in exploring those elements because of how much more time the characters get and the way they use visual storytelling to get points across. Getting back to it, Corey is on his way home after the fallout with Allison when the marching band kids spot him while they're out for a joyride. Danny Gonzalez here is being a little shit as always, but because of either the drinks, the adrenaline, or everything going on all stacking up, he's not taking any shit from them. Also, holy fucking music, this score is so goddamn good, man. I know what it looks like when somebody hates you. When your father fucking hates you. Hmm? <laughs> anyway, they're doing this because of the tire being slashed, and when Corey gets defensive with a knife and starts taunting Terry, the marching band kid gets emotional and throws Corey over the barricade. The vagabond from earlier is sitting by a fire below, and he sees Corey being dragged into the sewer by someone inside. I love how creepy that moment is. If you're not an absolute idiot, you'll have picked up on the fact that Michael's been hiding away in the sewer, and Corey wakes up in this beautifully eerie set that was built on a soundstage. The sewer is a spot that'll be revisited a few times, and it's so fucking cool. That deep bluish green lighting gives it an isolated and sickly tone that fits really well, and there are some moments where you have to really strain to see clearly. We're 40 minutes into the movie now, and Michael hasn't shown up yet, so I think you know what's coming. Corey spots the exit tunnel and starts making his way towards the opening, but he's stopped in his tracks by a rotten hand grabbing him. Our first look at Michael Myers and Halloween Ends is through a cracked tunnel veiled by cobwebs, and holy good god almighty does this tickle something in my brain. I love the idea of Michael slowly rotting away below the town of Haddonfield for the last few years. This scene is where things start to get really out there. Michael holds Corey and locks eyes with him, and we see flashes of the things that have happened to Corey since the night of the accident. The question that's really left up to your interpretation is what these flashes are actually indicating. There's always been something dark going on within the inky blackness of Michael's eyes, and maybe what we're seeing is just Corey being reminded of all the horrible things that have happened. These flashes could be going on inside of his own head as he looks back on the past, but the other option is a much more bizarre idea. It could be that Michael is looking into Corey's eyes and seeing the things he's been through, testing whether or not he'd be fit to fill the shoes Michael's aging out of. This theory has a ton of implications about Michael. Halloween 2018 left things pretty up in the air with whether or not Michael was supernatural, 
and Kills definitely leaned into him being the boogeyman more than a human. Up to this point though, it could be said that Michael is not supernatural, but a man capable of things beyond the norm. That's a vague sentiment, but it's one that's pretty easy to swallow. If you see this as Michael reading Corey's thoughts and literally transferring something evil into him, then there's no room for debate about whether or not Michael is supernatural. It's indisputable that he is. Something that I've always felt Halloween Kills really nailed was portraying Michael as this ambiguous, borderline mythical shape. I don't lean towards him being a ghost or anything like that, but I've always felt there was something else going on that made him not quite a man. And that's why I think calling him the Boogeyman is so fitting. Kills hit that note perfectly for me, and this moment could really fuck with how someone views Michael. I don't care about knowing exactly what happened here, because I find the mystery of it compelling, and I enjoy piecing together my own interpretation of it. I do lean more towards the supernatural side, because there are a few hints that Something in Michael is also in Corey, like the way he sits up later on. Then again, the vagabond who hangs around where Michael's been rotting away seemed to notice something about Corey earlier on in the movie, which makes me think maybe there was something in Corey that was waiting to be pulled front and center, and seeing the darkness in Michael's eyes was the catalyst for that. This trilogy's made it pretty clear that people who looked into those eyes are changed by what they saw, and I think Loomis's speech in the 1978 film perfectly sums up exactly what that is. The blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. It could be that there really is something about Michael that's simply not human, and it's one thing to be told that and see the awful things the boogeyman is capable of, but looking into that blackness and seeing for yourself the absence of light that Loomis was talking about changes you, plain and simple. It could terrify you and make you spend your whole life feeling like you need to build a fortress to protect yourself from the evil you didn't think was possible, or make you look for distraction, comfort, and protection from others even if they're bad people, or maybe it could pull something from inside of you that's always been there waiting to be woken up. I love how this trilogy opens up that sort of discussion and gives a lot of room for personal interpretation. I've laid out the way that I look at it, but you might take away something completely different from what I said, and you might prefer the way you see it. I don't think Michael transferred something into Corey, but I do think there was something inside of Corey that got woken up by the darkness inside of Michael's eyes, and that changed him forever. The score for this scene isn't called transference, it's called transformation. It could be something similar to what's inside of Michael, which would explain why Corey acts the way he does at times. The Halloween franchise doesn't really have a great track record for explaining why Michael is the way he is, but this trilogy handled that with the most success. It keeps the mythology of Michael from the first movie intact by only adding developments that are in line with the way he was portrayed in that movie, and it uses Corey as a way to explore what makes something evil without demystifying Michael. Fucking bravo. So yeah, this is a moment that raises a lot of questions, but the result is made clear when Corey stumbles out of the sewer and kills the vagabond. I did say I wasn't going to use the novelization to defend the movie, but there is a really cool backstory to the vagabond that I thought you might find interesting. The man's name is Nelson Christopher, a nod to Christopher Nelson, the absolute beast of a makeup effects artist this trilogy has had. He was apparently an inmate at Smith's Grove that Sartain would torture and abuse trying to get a reaction from Michael, and after being utterly traumatized by this, his mind twisted him into seeing Michael as some sort of god. He was released by Smith's Grove after a class action lawsuit, and eventually found Michael here and decided to stick around because of his devotion to him. Figured I'd bring that up because it adds a lot more background to the character and also Sartain. I gotta say, like seriously, if you're interested in getting this story more developed, Read the novelization. I've read the one for Kills and I've read the one for Ends. I haven't done the one for 2018 yet, but that Ends novelization added so much. There, there are a few scenes in there that, I, God, I, I really wish would have been in the movie. It, it's, it's absolutely worth reading. This is the turning point of the movie, where Corey begins a downward spiral into darkness and violence, lashing back at the town that turned their backs on him after the accident. He's changed, and if there's anyone who can recognize what the eyes of the boogeyman look like, it's Laurie Strode. When Corey shows up unannounced to try and mend things with Allison, Laurie knows right away that something's changed. She sees that look in his eye, and she begins to fear for Allison when she suspects Corey will follow in the footsteps of Michael. I've got to bring up how good even the scenes in broad daylight look. This really feels like a brisk October day, and you can see it's a tone that David Gordon Green really understands how to capture. Corey is ready to let Allison in, and he shows her that by saying this. I killed someone. 
This line has been misinterpreted so many times. I can see why, because we just saw Cory kill the Vagabond, so it could seem like he's referring to the murder he committed, which would make Allison's reaction seem really weird. The reason that she reacts like this is because she sees this as Cory opening up about what happened with Jeremy, and she can probably relate with the self-blame. That's what he meant when he said he killed someone. It was just a way to show her that he's letting down the barrier he held strong between them the other night. It's really chilling, actually, because him saying this has more meaning than Allison realizes. It simultaneously shows that they're going to become more intimate and he's becoming dangerous. So it raises the stakes a lot for Allison. This is a great fucking script. Corey takes her to the Allen house, left abandoned after what happened, just like the Myers home. Kids probably dare each other to go in at night and tell ghost stories. This is where the two really let down the guardrails and let each other in. I wanted it to be a fun night. That's all just a good night. Oh, for God's sake, this score, man, it's, it, this is ridiculous. This sequence is full of some beautiful cinematography, and it gives the house an isolated, almost otherworldly feel. It's become a ghost story like the Myers home, and there's a dreamlike feel once we're inside. Later that night, they have a conversation at a diner about the isolated place they've both been backed into, and it's pretty clear that they both have a level of anger that they're reaching a tipping point with. They're interrupted by Doug Mullaney, and when he won't leave Allison alone after she clearly dismisses him, Corey snaps. Let me tell you, it's, uh, to change your mind. There's he said we're good! At the start of the movie, Mullaney was seen as one of the officers present on the night Jeremy died, so he recognizes Corey, and things get heated. You feel safe with this guy? And there's the tipping point. Corey drops Allison off at home, but he declines her invitation to come inside with her. She may not have noticed the car trailing behind them, but he did, and Corey's got something in mind for Doug Mullaney. He baits the cop along, taking great joy in messing with him before running off into the sewer where Doug follows. Good. God, man, I love how they handle the lighting in the sewer. This is the first of a few scenes in Halloween Ends where it's really asking you to bear with it so it can flesh out the story it's telling. Corey's lord dug in here, knowing that Michael will do what Michael does, and Michael does what Michael does right after Corey gives Doug this evil fucking grin. But that beating from the end of Halloween Kills and Michael's age is all catching up with him now, and he's clearly really weak. Corey starts egging Michael on, but he's berating him like a parent, and that's a really weird thing to see. Corey holds Doug, and Michael retrieves his knife from the stone, slitting the cop's throat. He stabs him and- Did he just come? The way I've actually interpreted this is that Michael just gets a surge out of killing. I don't think it's any secret that he enjoys it. He tends to make a bit of a show out of it. This scene is just asking a lot from viewers, and it's uncomfortable and awkward for a multitude of reasons. Seeing Michael as weak as he is here is a weird thing. We've never seen him like this before, and then- to have Corey basically baby him into murdering Doug results in a strange moment. I'm torn on this whole thing, because atmospherically, it's a fucking stunner. The lighting on Michael's mask and the score makes for a really haunting image of the shape, and I think the biggest reason this scene doesn't bother me is because it gets across a feeling of, oh fuck, this is really bad, some terrible things are about to happen. Michael's gotten a little juice from killing Doug, and Corey is clearly turning violent, so the amount of danger that's waking up in the sewer in this moment is intimidating. It's a hard pill to swallow, seeing Michael like this, but I don't... I honestly don't mind it. It makes sense for him to be breaking down like this. He's in his 60s, and he got absolutely fucked up four years ago, and he's been rotting away since then, so him being weakened doesn't seem out of left field at all. The way I see it is the reason he had so much life in him back in 2018 is because he'd been waiting for that one final night of mayhem. And the burst of a monster we see in Kills was the result of the fire. It's interesting to get such a different depiction of the shape than we're used to seeing, and thematically, it does make sense. I like that N sets up a more reasonable version of Michael for Laurie to inevitably take on. It also makes the efforts of Tommy and the rest of Haddonfield have purpose. When I went back and rewatched Kills recently, Tommy's death had a whole new emotional layer because I kept thinking about how he died thinking that his fight was for nothing, but he was actually integral to getting Michael down to a point where he could be faced. I want to take a second to talk about the look of Michael in this movie because this trilogy has by far the best looking Michael Myers since the original. In Halloween 2018, Michael looked like a very natural progression of Nick Castle's portrayal from back then, and the mask was the best and most faithful update we've ever had. James Jude Courtney was also perfect in the physical performance he gave, and that carried over to Kills where we had the burnt mask that's 
probably the coolest looking Michael Myers in the franchise. I love the progression into ends with the moldy and cobweb covered mask and coveralls. It looks so disgusting and creepy. From here on out, Corey becomes more and more violent while also growing much closer with Allison. Well, all the while, Lori's concerns about the darkness in Corey grow stronger. Lindsay has brought along someone who can give their two cents on what's happening with Corey, that being Roger Allen. Unlike Teresa, he didn't jump to Corey being a killer when Jeremy died, and it seems like he had some sympathy for him. Now, some kids, you can tell they're a pain in the ass, but Corey was a good kid. But something's making him think things are changing for the man who used to do his lawn work. And he looks at me, and it's not him. At least not in the eyes. That shot of Corey is chilling. Allison gets the charged nurse position ripped from her hands by Miss Throat Goblin, and she seems to be reaching a point where being around the people of Haddonfield is unbearable. Thankfully, justice always prevails, and once we see Dr. Mathis take Nurse Deb home, you know this is going to be a satisfying scene. Yeah. Deb's in the shower when she hears commotion and goes outside to investigate, not noticing the scratch marks on the sliding glass door. You can see something going on in the background, but apparently sound only travels on light waves because we only hear the corkscrew repeatedly stabbing Mathis when Deb flicks the light on. Ah! Hey, Vanessa kind of got her wish. I'm gonna quit that punch job. Dr. Mathis in the face. Corey chases Deb, but she locks the door behind her before he can get inside. And that's when the boogeyman shows himself and makes quick work of her in like the seventh time Bob's death has been recreated. Look, Michael doesn't get much to do in this movie, which, you know, I'm okay with that. But considering that, it would have been nice to get some original and memorable kills from him in ends. He only kills three people in this movie, and one of them is a recreation of a death we've seen so many times. That's lame, but I still think this is a great scene. The hazy sight of motion behind Deb when she goes outside, the reflections from this pool shimmering on everything, and Corey's absolutely unhinged lunacy as he charges at Deb. It's Brutal as shit, but it's also weird seeing Michael teaming up with someone. We don't know what his motivations are for doing so, which is pretty much in line with Michael in general. It could be that he's trying to pass on the violence to Corey, but the way I see it, it's just that Michael's just curious about him. He's always had this weird, playful side to him, which is something I was really glad to see back in this trilogy, so that's how I look at this scene. One thing that's definitely new is that there's a melodramatic love story going on between Corey and Allison. This kind of thing is really hard to make work in a movie like this because people are not buying tickets to a Halloween movie for character development and a dark love drama, but Again, I'm invested enough in the story at this point that I found this all really interesting. They have a conversation on top of the radio station we saw a few times in Halloween Kills, and this movie's starting to give off goth punk vibes with the steady synth and deep red light. Corey decides to fuck with Allison a bit, and this is where we see that all too familiar motion from him. Willie, the DJ that we've heard throughout the movie going on about crazy conspiracies, comes outside and is immediately hostile towards both of them. Y'all get the hell up off my property before I fuck y'all up. That's the straw that broke the camel's back for Allison, and she agrees to leave Haddonfield with Corey, who also has his mind set when he returns home and gets confronted by Joan. Oh no. No. Did Joan think Freud was right? There's not as much humor in Halloween Ends as there was in the last two entries, but this moment with Ronald gives me a good chuckle. I hope you find love. With that, we finally made it to All Hallows' Eve, and there's a very disturbing reveal that Corey's sleeping on the bloodstain left behind by Jeremy. This scene that's coming up is an interesting one, and I think there's more going on than meets the eye. Lori appears in the room, steadily rocking back and forth in a chair leaning against the wall. It takes no time at all for her to start one of her patented monologues about the nature of evil. There's the evil that exists as an external force that threatens the well-being of the tribe. She sets Corey off when she demands that he stay away from Allison, and he starts a speech of his own when he very clearly threatens Lori with Allison's safety. If I can't have her, no one will. You should surrender to that feeling you had the first time you ever looked into his eyes. This scene, again, I keep saying this, but it has one of the best bits of score of the entire franchise. It's so dark and foreboding. Seriously, 
This track is on my mind regularly. When Cory looks back up, Lori's nowhere to be found. He searches for her, but turns up with nothing but the sight of the curtains gently blowing in the Halloween wind, and then- Oh, fuck, fuck, oh god, Jesus, please stop! Shh, it's okay. It's okay, my love. I love this scene, but here's the thing. I'm not entirely convinced that Lori was ever actually there. There's a very dreamlike quality to the whole thing, but what really makes me wonder if this is all inside of Corey's head is when Lori throws the paper airplane in a callback to Jeremy playing with one at the start of the movie. Her dialogue also feels paced in a disorienting way, and the haze from the light outside gives her an almost ethereal look. I don't know if Lori would have just left like that considering what he just said, so to me, it does seem like Corey's mind was conjuring this all up. Whether that's the case or not, it makes him feel like he needs to speed up his planned exodus with Allison, so after some manipulation, he has one stop to make before they leave town at nightfall. If you weren't already weirded out enough by seeing Michael hobble around earlier, this scene is sure to get you there. Corey returns to the sewer one last time to find Michael standing stoically in the corner and starts fighting with him. The two wrestle in this beautiful steady shot through the tunnel, with Corey ultimately tackling Michael to the ground and making off with the mask. Corey's out for his final spree in Haddonfield before he and Allison leave town together, and first up are the marching band kids who lit the match. Corey grabs their attention at the gas station from earlier on by scratching up Terry's dad's car and lures them to the junkyard. I have no qualms whatsoever with saying that this is one of the best sequences of the franchise, and <laughs> I'm sorry, again, also has one of the best bits of score. Corey locks them in the junkyard in a shot that reminds me so much of 80s horror for whatever reason, and completely oblivious to the trap they've just been locked in, they decide they're gonna drag Corey's motorcycle along the road and just shred it. I alluded to this a while ago, but never actually talked about it. Halloween Ends is not just a sequel in the Halloween franchise, it's also a loving homage to John Carpenter's Christine. Corey shares a lot in common with Arnie Cunningham beyond just the name and attire. He has a similar arc and the problems at home, and if you had any doubts about the similarities between these two movies, then the Junkyard sequence spells it out pretty blatantly. The two movies have a very similar tone, and the score also feels very reminiscent, and this scene is the culmination of all of that. Corey absolutely brutalizes these kids, even ramming Margot with a truck, despite her being the only one in the group who didn't entirely suck. Even Ronald is sadly killed when he comes out to help after Terry got his attention. In a world where so many people are just fucking awful, Ronald was an absolute gem, and this is tragic. The marching band is taken out one at a time, and the scene culminates with Corey putting a fucking blowtorch in Terry's mouth and then head stomping Margot like she was jealous of Sartain. Good god, man, Chris Nelson's VFX work is stellar. Even this behind the scenes footage is cringeworthy. It just looks way too real. This crazy thing happens when you work with Chris Nelson is the head is so real that when you're doing it, it's just the most disturbing, disgusting thing. Also, Margot's death got quite heavily edited. I'm, I'm holding out hope that someday we can get the alternate ending to Halloween 2018 and an extended cut of ends because the behind the scenes shows a lot of really cool shit that didn't make the final cut. You did too. Yeah, that scene was amazing. The looming sense of something really bad about to happen with the score building up to Corey just ripping through these people gives me chills every time. I would have been bothered if Corey acted exactly the same way as Michael did, but there's a much more unhinged nature to his killings that sets him apart. Also, I like how the shots of him turning on the blowtorch mirror him at work earlier on in the movie. Corey's still got a few names to cross off before splitting, and Joan is next up. He's killing a family member, so it's only fitting that we get a POV shot of him grabbing a knife from the drawer in the kitchen, just like the opening of the original movie. This scene was also cut down substantially, and good god is the footage they shot brutal. And incredibly satisfying because Joan was a nightmare. Corey then makes his way to the radio station where he sets his sight on Willie after he played a huge part in the town turning on Corey with the way he talked about him since the accident. Corey kills the receptionist off screen, which was another kill that had a lot more footage originally than we got in the theatrical release. There have been a number of pretty brutal kills in the last few minutes, but Willie's is about to top all of them and it looks like this was left pretty uncut. Corey enters the studio and starts smashing the DJ's face into the record player, bloodying the bastard up so much that his teeth are falling out and his jaws dislocated, and then he cuts his tongue 
tongue out with a pair of scissors. That's gotta be one of the gnarliest and most sadistic kills in this entire franchise. His tongue just bounces around on the record, and I love the idea of people listening to this right now, unaware that the reason it's skipping is because his tongue is in the way. Also, pretty cool shot of Willie's head perfectly lining up with the mural of himself on the wall behind him. I'm telling you, man, David Gordon Green is a good director. Laurie and Allison had a bit of a falling out earlier tonight, where Laurie was doing everything she could to stop Allison from leaving with the man infected by the darkness that's haunted her life for decades. Something that I really love about Halloween Ends is the quieter tone it employed. There's no music in this scene, just the isolated voice of two women whose lives were torn apart by an evil neither of them understand. Laurie's desperation to save Allison feels so raw and tragic, but Allison's made up her mind. When I trusted you, my friends are dead. My parents are dead. After failing to get Allison to answer her phone, Lori walks upstairs, looking like she's at the end of the rope. She just can't seem to escape the horror that Halloween night brings with it, and she lights a jack-o'-lantern in her room, almost as if she's saying, okay, you win. She sits at the desk by the window and pours herself a drink before grabbing a revolver from the drawer. I love how quiet this is. A lot of this movie is reflecting on the effects of something like Michael Myers, and this moment hits hard where that's concerned. Lori takes a moment to look at a picture of Karen before calling 911 and reporting a suicide. This is heavy. Seeing Lori after all she's been through brought to this moment, it's, it's rough. If you look closely though, you'll see a shadow on the staircase. It looks like Corey's come to claim his final victim, but a loud gunshot is heard and the walls are splattered just before he enters the room. Did you really think I'd kill myself? Lori fucking strode. That's one of the most well-crafted sequences in a Halloween movie. It's all set up really well to look like Lori's about to kill herself, and it could have been a really simple bait and switch, but I love how everything about it is recontextualized the moment that the reveal happens. What first looked like Lori deciding that she's done was actually her seeing something that wasn't shown, or at the very least, she feels the presence of whatever Michael leaves behind. Her lighting the jack-o'-lantern isn't her saying, you win, it's her saying, fucking bring it on. And then she outs the viewer for believing the facade. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about when I say that Halloween Ends is a genuinely well-made movie. It's got a lot of hard pills to swallow for fans, but the script and the direction is great. Well, Corey certainly lost the element of surprise there. Laurie's an absolute badass and gives Corey a chance to really take his shot, but <laughs> Allison shows up and the sound of her muffler scraping on the road is distinct enough to tip both of them off that it's her. Looks like she's about to learn the truth about Corey. If I can't have her. This movie's amazing. <laughs> Allison drives off and Lori collapses, now in a genuine state of hopelessness with her granddaughter thinking she murdered the only person Allison cared about. Also, another awesome script detail that I've been waiting to talk about is that Corey and Allison's entire relationship was played out right in front of us back at that party. If you, if you pay attention to them dancing together, each story beat is reflected, culminating in her holding his head with smiles on both of their faces and much the same way that she does now as he bleeds out on the floor. Apparently people have said that this scene doesn't make any sense because Allison would see the mask and piece together what's going on. It seems like a lot of people just completely disregard the state of mind the characters are in in this trilogy and assume they're just like perfectly analytical and in a headspace where they can think everything out really well. Even if Allison noticed the mask, I don't know if it would really mean anything in the emotional state she's in here. She'd probably pieced together that something was wrong after she left, but in the moment, it totally makes sense for her not to make that connection. Andy Maticek fucking kills it in this movie, and I'm glad she got more to do as the trilogy went on. I'd love to see more of her character in the future, but I'm not really sure how that would work. As Lori sits on the floor, she notices the back door to the house standing open, and immediately she knows something's wrong. It's time for one last fight between Lori and the shape. Before that though, Corey grabs at Michael's wrist when he reaches for his knife, but Michael's through with the kid's bullshit. 
Now reunited with his mask, he watches as Lori walks into the kitchen pretending not to notice him and hides in the closet. As Allison drives through the night without the partner she thought she'd be leaving with, she notices that the radio tower Corey had shown her is up in flames, which is what tips her off to something being wrong. Frank calls her in a panic asking about Lori calling in the suicide, and that's when she realizes what she'd actually walked in on. It's time for the final fight between Michael and Lori, and there's a lot about this that I really like. I appreciate how they set up some of it earlier on, so things like the fire extinguisher or the microwave exploding food don't come out of absolutely nowhere. Jimmy Lee Curtis talked about the fight in this movie in a way that made me really excited. As long as it doesn't look like a movie fight, I will be happy. They definitely achieved that to a degree, although I don't think it quite feels as raw as she made it out to seem. It probably did during the shoot, but that feeling didn't fully translate. It is brutal though, and it has a few nods to previous movies like The Knitting Needle and a throwback to Halloween H2O with the garbage disposal. One of these days, a Halloween movie is gonna have to go through with that because that's twice now that they've teased it. Lori uses the tried and true tactic of pulling up Michael's mask for a momentary distraction and pins his hands on the island. This moment is powerful. She climbs up and stabs him in the chest and after getting knocked back, pins his other hand down and hammers the knife in with a pan before throwing the fridge on his legs to lock him down. Using the reflection of a knife, Lori forces the shape to look into its own eyes and delivers a killing blow. <laughs> Time to let some things out. I thought maybe you were the boogeyman. As Michael bleeds out on the island, he grabs Lori's throat and starts choking her, a fate which she seems to accept. This flashback, just like the one at the start, it actually made me tear up in the theater. Fuck off, I don't want to hear it. As she did in 2018, Allison stops Michael at the last minute by running in and snapping his fucking arm in half. That's awesome. Also, this looks like a reference to Friday the 13th Part 4, and I'm all here for it. Ensuring that the beast is truly dead, Lori slits his wrist, and here lies the shape being drained of all the blood in its body while Lori and Allison look over it in victory. Frank shows up with a number of other officers and walks in on quite a sight, but Allison knows how this shit works and she's not taking any chances. I'm not dead enough. Now look, I've been defending and praising this despised movie so much that I'm sure this video is probably gonna make me lose more subscribers than I'll gain from it, but I've got to say what I think about it, otherwise there's no point in me making these videos anyway. I absolutely love the procession sequence. So much of this trilogy has focused on the effects that Michael had, not just on our central cast of characters, but on the town of Haddonfield as a whole. This was one of the most potent moments I've had in a movie theater, seeing Michael finally taken down after all the mayhem and then being tied to the squad car to show off to the whole town. They've all lost so much at the hands of the boogeyman and his shadow has torn a hole through this once peaceful town, leaving violence behind. This feels like a really powerful way of saying, we got him. It was a genuinely emotional moment for me, but I know that there are a lot of people who find this really silly. I think the thing that makes this trilogy work for me as a whole is that it feels like a heightened, almost Shakespearean take on the Halloween formula, which is something that you'll either love or hate. The mob stuff in Kills works for me, and this procession really works for me, but that's all a matter of what you're looking for in one of these movies. For me, it was a really potent scene that- Are you fucking kidding me? I'd like to see him in Halloween Ends, retired after realizing how badly he's failed the town and its people. He didn't believe in the boogeyman, and people died because of it. He badly needs to be fleshed out before this story comes to an end. You're just standing here! Please do something! What the- Fuck. What the hell was the purpose of Sheriff Barker? He's done literally nothing for this entire trilogy. I thought that he'd have some sort of part or arc and role in this movie in the way it played out, but because they didn't plan any of this out ahead of time, he just randomly shows up at the end. Omar's a good actor too, this is so stupid. Easily one of the most baffling and pointless characters in Halloween. I forgot he was even part of the last two movies until he showed up here. Okay, well there is one more thing I have to talk about with this procession scene before we get to the movie's conclusion, and that's the music, again. This trilogy has had the best music of the entire franchise overall, and it's not even a competition. Each of these movies has had at least one track that became an instant classic for me. The Procession is a strong competitor for my favorite piece of score in the franchise since the original movie. This sums up everything that the trilogy was doing with the character of Michael and the town of Haddonfield 
with an incredibly grandiose and haunting send off to the boogeyman. It feels like everything since 1978 is being let out here in this piece, and it's truly something special that was a huge reason this hit as hard as it did. They bring Michael to the junkyard as the town of Haddonfield follows, and hey, we might not have gotten more lines from Julian, but it's nice to see Jabril Nantambu make an appearance in all three of these movies. Sandra and her sister join in the march, and this stuff is why I find this scene so powerful. Everyone's finally getting to see this monster taken down. Michael's carried to the car crusher, Allison turns it on, and Lori drops the boogeyman in. There's something oddly peaceful about seeing that. The epilogue of the movie shows Lori in a sunlit room finalizing the memoir she was writing. She talks to Allison, who now sees what Corey was, and she decides to go through with her plan of leaving Haddonfield to find herself somewhere else. Lori continues writing, and Frank drops off a basket of fresh vegetables and flowers on her porch. This epilogue is another sequence where I have to commend the music because it's just absolutely beautiful. But the truth is, evil doesn't die. It changes shape. I love how sweet this interaction is. He talks like he's about to leave, but he doesn't budge as he waits for her to invite him in. What was it you were saying about those cherry blossoms? It looks like they're going to Japan together to look at the cherry blossoms. The original movie ended with still shots of empty rooms as the theme played over and left you with a haunting feeling. This is mirrored and ends with the same approach of the still shots, but this time there's no music. It's bright and sunny out, and the only sound heard is the birds singing away outside as Laurie and Frank join together outside to live out their remaining years together. The final shot shows the mask sitting on a table in Laurie's office, a reminder of everything she's been through and overcome. Perfect song choice to end the movie on. From what I can tell, it's the last song Laurie listened to before Michael tore her life apart, and now it plays again recontextualized by the events that have played out since. So, that's Halloween Ends, and the conclusion to David Gordon Green's Halloween trilogy that kicked off in 2018. I know I'm in a small camp of people who really dig not just this movie, but the trilogy as a whole. There are some things that personally make it mean more to me. The, the time you see something and the people you see it with can have a huge impact on how you feel about that thing, but this is genuinely my favorite Halloween timeline. It's flawed without question, and there's a lot of messiness that really shows how important planning ahead is when you're writing a story, but flaws and all, I find this to be a very satisfying timeline. I would say Ends is the best written out of the trilogy, but it's also not without problems. That four-year time jump should have been filled in more to make the opening less jarring, and if you'll notice, Corey just disappears at the end. He's the focus for most of the movie, but he ends up dying and his story just doesn't matter for the rest of the movie. This is another example of this trilogy not fully going through with its ideas, but it's not something that bothers me if I'm being honest. He served his purpose for this story by exploring the nature of evil and the effect Michael had on Haddonfield, and even though I really liked his arc, I'm, I'm not really all that interested in seeing another movie with Corey as a killer. To me, that was an isolated storyline that worked well, but it works better staying isolated. The last 15 minutes or so is where Laurie and Michael wrap up their story, but it feels tacked on and should have gotten more time to breathe. That being said, there's something about the suddenness of their fight that feels very in line with the original. Michael goes around at random, and the only reason he was here was to get his mask back. Lori was just home. What I love about this trilogy is how it keeps the Michael from the original intact in a way that no other timeline in this franchise has done. He wasn't used as the ghostly figure from the original as much, but this portrayal feels like the most in line with the original movie that we've gotten. Everything from the look, the performance, the playfulness, the mystery, and the lack of motivation beyond the sake of it feels exactly how I think Michael would be after all these years. I love the characters throughout that felt quirky and interesting in a way that David Gordon Green is really good at, even if the dialogue can be rough. The town of Haddonfield feels the most alive out of any timeline, and I both respect and enjoy the bold and bizarre turns the story took. I have a lot of respect for Blumhouse for allowing David Gordon Green to realize this vision that everyone knew would be incredibly divisive, and that kind of creative freedom is important. Halloween Ends is an emotional movie. It steps away from the mayhem of kills and tells a more subdued story about the stain that violence leaves behind, and how outcasts can be treated by a society that sees them as an easy target. It all works really well for me, but here's the thing. After Halloween 2018 and Kills, the logical place to close things off would have been an epic conclusion 
tying up loose ends from the last two and hone things in to make the most faithful Halloween sequel. We kept hearing about how the scope of this movie was much more in line with the original, and in some ways it is. It's quieter than the last two, but it's a hell of a lot more complicated than what they made it out to be. At the end of the day, fans wanted an epic showdown between Laurie Strode and Michael Myers to close off this story, and that's exactly what the marketing would lead audiences to believe this was. All of the trailers and posters sold this as that final battle, and as a pretty straight up slasher movie with Michael Myers loose on Halloween night killing people again. What we got was a weird and experimental movie that sidelined Michael, introduced a new character that a large majority of the runtime is spent on, and delivered a twisted love story that was a lot more concerned with character work and thematic exploration than it was with kills or resolving the story we've been following in a traditional way. That's something that will inevitably alienate audiences, and everyone involved knew this would be a divisive movie, hence the Halloween 3 font. I'm a fan of what they did with this movie, and I think I've made that pretty clear by now, but it's not at all what I hoped to see with the conclusion of this trilogy when it started back in 2018. When I first heard how David Gordon Green and Jamie Lee Curtis were talking about Halloween Ends, I'd envisioned a quieter, slowed down movie that would feel like the original and close things off with a nice little bow. Part of me still wishes that's how it ended, but there's so much that I find fascinating about the movie that we got, and I think it's got the best script of the trilogy. It's, it's absolutely beautifully directed, the score is a series highlight, and even though it's not what I'd hoped for, I feel satisfied with the way they close things off. The trilogy is messy, jumping all over the place with what they seemed like they were trying to do with this story. It can often feel like each of these movies had ideas that never got fully fleshed out, and it makes you wonder what could have been if they'd taken all the best parts of these and mushed them into, you know, one two-hour epic that would have made an insane one-two punch with the original movie. Despite all of its problems, this is my favorite Halloween timeline because for me, it feels the most complete. The ending of H2O was fantastic, but I've always found it to be too abrupt, especially because that movie was also dealing with the long-lasting effects of what happened. I wanted to see more of Laurie after Michael was taken down, and that's exactly what I got with the epilogue and ends, which is probably my favorite epilogue of the series. I'm always left feeling very touched by the conclusion of this story and with the sweet and optimistic closer, and this has become my headcanon for the franchise, even with the messiness. I appreciate the bold swings that were taken in these movies, both because I thought they worked well, but also because it makes for a really varied marathon. Halloween Ends is not what most fans wanted, and I know that. I completely understand why people were disappointed, because I also felt a lot of the same things about it. It took a while for this movie to fully click with me, which is the same experience I had with Kills. At the end of the day, the tone, direction, lore, characters, and music from this trilogy add up to a very emotional and atmospheric story that has really resonated with me, but it's not going to for everyone. I do think Halloween Ends will age well. Look back at Halloween 3, which was widely hated upon its release, but over time it's gotten a lot more appreciation. And I think with time and distance, Halloween Ends will see something similar, because there's so much good here that got overshadowed by mismarketing and the movie's position as the end to this trilogy. It's really unorthodox as an ending, but that's something I really like about it. The way that I look at this story overall is that the original Halloween is the myth that gets told at campfires around All Hallows' Eve by the residents of Haddonfield. Halloween 2018 and Kills are the return of this long-storied evil that shows itself to be something that we really can't understand. One final night of havoc is brought upon the town by this monster that's been nothing more than a ghost story for a long time leaving the town itself to turn into a hate-fueled rampage that Michael created without even being aware of it. That's the power of the myth he left behind. And then there's Halloween Ends, the quiet epilogue which shows the aftermath of what something like that does to a town, and how people will always need something to direct their fears toward so that they don't feel as abstract. It's the stain of evil, and while Michael has really limited screen time in it, his presence is felt from start to finish because of the scars that he tore into Haddonfield. That's the way I look at this trilogy, and I love it. One thing to note about Halloween Ends is that if you can set aside that it's separating itself, there's a lot in this movie that feels very true to the tone of the first movie. The look and feel hit some of the same notes, and even John Carpenter was praising Ends in a way that I haven't seen him do with any other Halloween movie. I know this video is incredibly long, and in some places probably unnecessarily so, but there's something about these movies that makes me want to dive into every little detail. If you've watched through this entire thing, thank you very much for indulging me in what's been the biggest undertaking on this channel so far. It's been many months in the making, and in reality I know it's probably gonna tank, but 
This franchise is very important to me, and I had too much to say about Ends to not go this in depth on it. I do plan on making videos about all the other movies in this franchise at some point, but next up I'll be ranking all 13 films in a video that will probably result in a net loss for the channel, but it'll be worth it. Until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.